Hello from the Gambia, and a very warm welcome to U.S. Embassy Banjul's Global Readathon Hour. And we just want to let you know that we are hosting this program in partnership with the Center for Studies in Africa and its diaspora at Georgia State University in Atlanta. And just to let you know that, again, this is the second collaboration between U.S. Embassy Banjo and CSAD as we come together to uh, celebrate Black History Month. And um, this afternoon, um, we have here with us the United States Ambassador to the Gambia, Sharon L. Cromer, who has been with us last year again on this Global Readathon. And uh, we have our remarkable young readers and authors here with us this afternoon, Cherno Gay, we have Lala Toure, and uh, we have Mudla Minso. And they have selected uh, compelling books to read. And we have a panel of George who will be listening to them. And part of them is the uh, former Minister of Information uh, of the Republic of the Gambia, Mr. Demba Ali Jawa, and Mr. Uh, Hamadi Michael Secker. He is also here with us, and they'll be listening to this uh, three remarkable young readers as they read from their books. They will have the opportunity to introduce uh, the books that they'll be reading from. And like I said, this is all geared towards celebrating Black History Month. And um, as the program goes on, we also have a talented young Cora player here with us this afternoon who will be entertaining uh, this uh, beautiful audience. And so without further ado, I will just uh, allow the program to start and hand over the microphone to the U.S. Ambassador to the Gambia, Sharon L. Cromer, to kick off the program. Over to you, Ambassador. Greetings from the Gambia, West Africa. It's a great pleasure to participate for a second year in the Global Readathon at Georgia State University Center for Studies on Africa and its Diaspora. Today, as we celebrate great authors, I'd like to share with you an author who has served as a tremendous source of inspiration for me for many years. The American writer and civil rights activist Dr. Maya Angelou. She once said, and I quote, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you, end quote. I'm grateful that Maya Angelou unlocked her own stories, sharing them and others with the world through more than 30 deeply introspective books and anthologies. When I seek strength, or simply wish to celebrate the beauty and bounty of being human, I read the inspiring lines from Maya Angelou's poems, Phenomenal Woman, and the incredible Still I Rise. Everyone, especially young people, should know and be inspired by the words of the great African and African-American writers and poets. And I am grateful to Georgia State University for organizing this program that celebrates and helps preserve the narratives and poetry of African and African-American writers from the diaspora. Their words must be heard. We also appreciate the opportunity to showcase artists in the Gambia. Those who are watching this event may, from other countries may not know that the Gambia is experiencing an exciting period of renaissance after emerging from 22 years of brutal dictatorship where many people, including artists, were silenced or forced into exile. The people of the Gambia have suffered the agony of bearing untold stories. At, U at the U.S. Embassy, Banjul, we work to support an emerging community of gifted Gambian writers, painters, filmmakers, actors, poets, dancers, musicians, and singers who are telling their stories. These artists are playing an important role in the future of the Gambian. I'm impressed by the creativity, fearlessness, vision of these incredible individuals. That includes the artists here today. 
While the Gambia is a small country, it has an abundance of brilliant people, including these artists. Now, let us listen and enjoy the words recited by our guests. All right, um, let's put our hands together for the ambassador. Let's keep it lively. <laughs> Um, as I introduce our readers um, for today, Cherno. Cherno is going to start, so Cherno will have the opportunity to introduce the book that he'll be reading from. And um, he'll introduce the author, the book, and uh, he will read um, uh, for about two or three minutes. And right after that, uh, Cherno will tell us why he chose this book and tell us the substance um, as far as this book is concerned. So we have Mr. Jawar, um, a rebel former minister, listening. We have Mr. Seka also listening. And at the end of the day, um, they will decide which of the books stands out. Nevertheless, all the books are perfect. So you're taking that set. That is for you. So we clap for uh, Cherno as he takes his set to read our first book. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I will be reading the book uh, from the book The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. Um, last year, I was part of this celebration, but as a poet, and if you remember, one of the lines I, I had in the poem I read was, the most dangerous creation by any society is the man who has nothing to lose. Uh, it's, a, it's a line from this book by James Baldwin, and I remember exactly mentioning his name immediately after that. Um, and so uh, I am very well acquainted with, uh, with African-American literature because it's connected to the continent and um, that's why I picked this book. So here we go. This past, the Negro's past of rope, fire, torture, castration, infanticide, rape, Death and humiliation, fear by day and night, fear as deep as the marrow of the bone, doubt that he was not worthy of life, since everyone around him denied it, sorrow for his women, for his kinfolk, for his children, who, he, who needed his protection and whom he could not protect, rage, hatred and murder, hatred for white men, so deep that it often turned against him and his own and made all love, all trust, all joy impossible. This past, this endless struggle to achieve and reveal and confirm a human identity, human authority, yet contains for all its horror something very beautiful. I do not mean to be sentimental about suffering enough is certainly as good as a feast. But people who cannot suffer can never grow, can never discover who they are. That man who is forced each day to snatch his manhood, his identity, out of the fire of human cruelty that rages to destroy it, knows if he survives his effort. And even if he does not survive it, something about himself and human life that no school on earth, and indeed no church, can teach. He achieves his own authority, and that is unshakable. This is because in order to save his life, he is forced to look beneath appearances, to take nothing for granted, to hear the meaning behind the words. If one is continually surviving the worst that life has to bring, one eventually ceases to be controlled by a fear of what life can bring. Whatever it brings must be born. And at this level of experience, one's bitterness begins to be palatable, and hatred becomes too heavy a sack to carry. The apprehension of life here, so briefly and inadequately sketched, has been the experience of generations of Negroes. And it helps to explain how they have endured, and how they have been able to produce children of kindergarten age who can walk through mobs to get to school. It demands great force and great cunning, continually to assault the mighty and indifferent fortress of white supremacy, as Negroes in this country have done so long. It demands great spiritual resilience, not to hate the hater whose food is on your neck, and an even greater miracle of perception. 
and charity, not to teach your child to hate. The Negro boys and girls who are facing mobs today come out of a long line of improbable aristocrats, the only genuine aristocrats this country has produced. I say this country because their frame of reference was totally American. They were hewing out of the mountains of white supremacy the stone of their individuality. I have great respect for that unsowing army of black men and women who trudged down back doors and lanes and entered back doors saying yes sir and no ma'am in order to acquire a new roof for the schoolhouse, new books, a new chemistry lab, more beds for the dormitories, more dormitories. They did not like, yes, they did not like saying yes sir or no ma'am but the country was in no hurry to educate Negroes. These black men and women knew that the job had to be done and they put their prides in their pockets in order to do it. It is very hard to believe that they were in any way inferior to the white man and woman who opened those back doors. It is very hard to believe that those men and women raising their children, eating their greens, carrying their courses, whipping their tears, singing their songs, making their love as the sun rose, as the sun set, were in any way inferior to the white men and women who crept out to share these splendors after the sun went down. Thank you. <laughs> now, the reason I particularly chose this book is because even though what Mr. Baldwin tried to do in this book is talk about the struggles for identity, the struggles for survival, the struggles for acceptance, the struggle to catch up after centuries of suffering of the black man in, in white America. I find a lot of similarities in what he was trying to say with what is happening in the continent right now. Because the book opens with a letter he wrote to his nephew. And he talked about his experience growing in the streets of Harlem and how, how he saw young boys and girls change and what the different elements within society turned them into. In Africa here, for me, we are generations removed from what our ancestors used to be without the residue and the complication that slavery and colonialism put on our people. And after those two major historical events happen right now, the biggest struggle Africa has had since independence is a struggle of identity crisis. It is socio-political, it is cultural, it is economical, and it affects us to this day. And reading through James's lines in this book, I find a very deep connection between the struggle he went through, between the struggle that he, he, he described that black people went through, trying to figure out how to fit in, in a society that stepped on them and is now saying we are equal, but not opening the door to make sure that equality happens. I find similar struggle happening in Africa to this day. And that is, that is what I find very appealing in this book. And that is why I picked this book. Um, I hope um, you have a, a similar feeling. But what I know is, if we keep celebrating this Black History Month, and if we're gonna keep having this conversation, then we must interrogate the question of who are we? Who can we be? Not who someone told us we are. Not who people say we need to be because of the experience we have been through. But who are we at our core? Unadulterated. Uncorrupted by the experiences of slavery and colonialism. This is the question we must keep asking. And listen, until we come up with that question, everything that we keep doing would be a copy of what the Eurocentric um, um, experience of colonialism has left with us. None of the things we do is original anymore. And so we must keep asking that question until we find the answer. And maybe none of us has the answer right now. But I think, I think the most important thing is, is the journey we take in finding the answer to that question. It is not a destination. We must keep asking questions like James does, um, like very quiet. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, thank you very much. So Lala Toure is our next reader. She will introduce the book, um, Read and the Fenha book. So it's all over to you, Dara. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really an honor to be here. 
and to be a part of this bookathon, uh, which I'm doing by the way, channels my best friend. So it's really great to be here doing this with him. We are going to come to who is going to come to us. <laughs> um, so I chose to read about um, this book written by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who um, tells inspirational stories about African women, black women, both in the, on the African continent, but also in the US. And this book is called We Should All Be Feminist. Um, and I chose to read this book because as the world is evolving, conversations are being held around equality, conversations are being held around ensuring inclusion in leadership, inclusion across different sectors in the world. Um, but women, black women, African women everywhere, both on the African continent and outside, continue to be faced with numerous challenges which limit their access to opportunities, limit their access to spaces where they can lead, where they can influence decisions, where they, they can actually take power, own power, and influence what happens in the world. So um, I'm going to read um, some parts of this book and I hope you like it as much as I do. Men and women are different. We have different hormones and different sexual organs and different biological abilities. Women can have babies, men cannot. Men have more testosterone and are, in general, physically stronger than women. There are slightly more women than men in the world. 52% of the world's population is female, but most of the positions of power and prestige are occupied by men. The late Kenyan Nobel Peace Prize winner, Wangari Matai, put it simply and well when she said, the higher you go, the fewer women there are. In the recent US elections, we kept hearing of the Lily Ledbetter law. And if we go beyond that nicely alliterative name, it was really about this. In the US, a man and a woman are doing the same job with the same qualifications, and the man is paid more because he is a man. So in a literal way, men rule the world. This made sense a thousand years ago, because, men, because human beings lived then in a world in which physical strength was the most important attribute for survival. The physically stronger person was more likely to lead, and men in general are physically stronger. There are, of course, many exceptions. Today we live in a vastly different world. The person more qualified to lead is not the physically stronger person. It is, the more the, it is the more intelligent, the more knowledgeable, the more creative, more innovative. And there are no hormones for these attributes. A man is as likely as a woman to be intelligent, to be innovative, to be creative. We have evolved, but our ideas of gender have not evolved very much. Not long ago, I walked into a lobby of one of the best Nigerian hotels, and a guard at the entrance stopped me and asked me annoying questions. What was the name and room number of the person I was visiting? Did I know this person? Could I prove that I was a, a hotel guest by showing him my key card? Because the automatic assumption is that a Nigerian female walking into a hotel alone is a sex worker. Because a Nigerian female alone cannot possibly be a guest paying for her own room. A man who walks into the same hotel is not harassed as I was. The assumption is that he is there for something legitimate. In Lagos, I cannot go alone into many reputable clubs and bars. They just don't let you in if you're a woman alone. You must be accompanied by a man. So I have male friends who arrive at clubs and end up going in with their arms linked with those of a complete stranger because that complete stranger, a woman out of her own, had no choice but to ask for help to get into the club. Each time I walk into a Nigerian restaurant with a man, a waiter greets the man and ignores me. The waiters are products of a society that has taught them that men are more important than women, and I know that they do not intend any harm, but it is, one, it is one thing to know something intellectually and quite another to feel it emotionally. Each time they ignore me, I feel invisible, I feel upset. I want to tell them that I am just as human as the man, just as worthy of acknowledgement. These are little things, but sometimes it is the little things that sting the most. Not long ago, I wrote an article about being young and female in Lagos, and an acquaintance told me that it was an angry article, and I should not have made it so angry. But I was unapologetic. Of course it was angry. Gender as it functions today is a grave injustice. I am angry. We should all be angry. Angry has a lo long history of bringing about positive change. But I am also hopeful 
because I believe deeply in the ability of human beings to make themselves for the better. But back to anger. I had the caution in the acquaintance's tone, and I knew that the comment was made about the article as it was about my character. Anger, the tone said, is particularly not good for a woman. If you are a woman, you're supposed to express anger. You're not supposed to express anger because it is threatening. I have a friend, an American woman, who took over a managerial position from a man. Her predecessor had been considered a tough go-getter. He was blunt and hard charging and was particularly strict about the signing of timesheets. She took on her new job and imagined herself equally tough, but perhaps a little kinder than him. He didn't always realize people had families, she did, and she said, and she did. Only a few weeks into her job, she disciplined an employee about a forgery on a timesheet, just as her predecessor would have done. The employee then complained to top management about her style. She was aggressive and difficult to work with, the employee said. Other employees agreed. One said they had expected that she would bring a woman's touch to her job, but she hadn't. It didn't occur to any of them that she was doing the same thing for which a man had been praised. I have another friend, also an American woman, who has a high-paying job in advertising. She is one of two women in her team. Once at a meeting, she said she had felt slighted by her boss, who had ignored her comments and then praised something similar when it came from a man. She wanted to speak up, to challenge her boss, but she didn't. Instead, after the meeting, she went to the bathroom and cried, then called me to vent about it. She didn't want to speak up. She did not want to speak up because she didn't want to seem aggressive. She let her resen resentment simmer. What struck me with her, and many other female American friends I have, is how invested they are in being liked. How they have been raised to believe that their being likable is very important and that this likable trait is a specific thing. And that specific thing does not include showing anger or being aggressive or disagreeing too loudly. We spend too much time teaching girls to worry about what boys think of them, but the reverse is not the case. We don't teach boys to care about being likable. We spend too much time telling girls that they cannot be aggressive or angry or tough which is bad enough, but then we turn around and either praise or excuse men for the, for the same reasons. All over the world, there are so many magazine articles and books telling women what to do, how to be and not be, in order to attract or please men. There are far fewer guides for men about pleasing women. I teach a writing workshop in Lagos, and one of the participants, a young woman, told me that a friend had told her not to listen to my feminist talk. Otherwise, she would absorb the ideas that would destroy her marriage. This is a threat, the destruction of a marriage, the possibility of not having a marriage at all, that in our society is much more like, likely to be used against a woman than against a man. Gender matters everywhere in the world. And I would like today to ask that we should begin to dream about and plan for a different world, a fairer world, a world of happier men and happier women who are truer to themselves. And this is how to start. We must raise our daughters differently, but we must also raise our sons differently. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, I think this was very self-explanatory. I chose to read about this because I want um, the U.S. Embassy partners that are watching this from the other side of the world. Um, especially the young girls and the young women that we're watching this, to know that they should have a voice, they deserve to have a voice. And as we are having conversations around, like I said before, equality, as we are having conversations around bringing people closer, um, righting the wrongs of the past, we must also con consider intersectional intersectionality. We must also consider being more inclusive, the needs, the experiences, the stories, the voices of women um, in these stories, in these experiences, in colonialism, in, 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 in current African-American um, population should also be considered. And we must remember to teach our boys and our girls how to be kind, but also how to work together in, a, in such a way that they're able to contribute to the socioeconomic and political development of their countries. So. Thank you very much, um, Lala. And our next reader is the president of the Young Writers Association of the Gambia, uh, Mr. Modu Lamin So. Uh, Modu Lamin is going to read. He's our final reader for today. He will also introduce his book, Read and Defend the Book. So it's over to you, Mr. So. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, the book I'm going to read is uh, titled The Sellout, written by Paul Betty, and it's the winner of the Man Booker Prize 2016. Uh, I, I think The Sellout is a fictitious satirical novel about racial relations in the U.S., and Betty utilizes stereotypes and parody throughout the story to inject social commentary, which is one of the reasons I decided to choose the book. And uh, I'm sure you're going to find the piece very interesting because it shows relations uh, in the United States, racial relations precisely, and it goes like this. This may be hard to believe coming from a black man, but I've never stolen anything, never cheated on my taxes or at cards, never snuck into the movies or failed to give back the extra chain to a drugstore cashier, indifferent to the ways of mercantilism and minimum wage expectations. I've never boggled a house, held up a liquor store, never boarded a crowded bus or shop worker, sat in a seat reserved for the elderly, pulled out my gigantic pennies and masturbated to satisfaction with a perverted yet somehow crestfallen look on my face. But here I am, in the cavernous chambers of the Supreme Court of the United States of America, my car illegally and somewhat ironically parked on Constitutional Avenue, my hands coughed and crossed behind my back, my right to remain silent long since waved and said goodbye to. As I sit in a thickly padded chair that, much like this country, isn't quite as comfortable as it looks, Shamorn here by an officious looking envelope stamped important in large sweepstakes red letters. I haven't stopped squirming since I arrived in this city. Dear sir, the letter read, congratulations. You may already be a winner. Your case has been selected from hundreds of other appellate cases to be heard by the Supreme Court of the United States of America. What a glorious honor. It is highly recommended that you arrive at least two hours early for your hearing scheduled for 10 a.m. on the morning of March 19, the year of our Lord. The letter closed with directions to the Supreme Court building from the airport, the train station, I-95, and a set of clip-out coupons to the various attractions, restaurants, beds, and breakfasts, and the like. There was no signature. It simply ended, sincerely yours the people of the United States of America. Washington, D.C., with its wide streets, confounding roundabouts, marble statues, dory columns, and domes, is supposed to feel like ancient Rome. That is, if the streets of ancient Rome were aligned with homeless black people, bomb-sniffing dogs, tour buses, and street blossoms. Yesterday afternoon, like some sandal from the sticks of the darkest of the Los Angeles jungles, I ventured from the hotel and joined the hatch of blue jean yokels that paraded slowly and patriotically past the empire's historic landmarks. I stare in you at the Lincoln Memorial. If honest ape had come to life and somehow managed to lift his bony 23 foot 4 inch frame from his throne, what will he say? What will he do? Will he break dance? Will he pick pennies against the corpse side? Will he read the paper and see that the union he saved was now a dysfunctional plutocracy, that the people he freed were now slaves to rhyme, rap, and predatory lending, and that today his skill set will be better suited to the basketball court than the White House? There he could catch the rock on the break, pulled up for a bearded three-pointer, hold the post, and talk shit as the ball popped the net, the great emancipator. You can't stop him. You can only hope to contain him. Not surprisingly, there is nothing to do at the Pentagon except start a war. Tourists aren't even allowed to take photos with the building in the background. So when this sailor suited family of Navy veterans four generations deep handed me a disponible camera and asked me to follow at a distance and secretly take photos of them while they serve while disponible camera, while they snapped to my attention, saluted and flashed peace signs for no apparent reason, I was only, hope, I was only happy to serve my country. 
At the National Mall, there was a one-man march on Washington. A lone white boy lay on the grass, fucking with the depth perception in such a way that the distant Washington monument looked like a massive pointed tip Caucasian had on streaming from his unzipped trousers. He joked with passersby, smiling into their camera phones and stroking his trick photograph priapism. At the zoo, I stood in front of the premade cage listening to a woman marvel at how presidential the 400 pound gorilla looked sitting astride, sound oaking limb, keeping a watchful eye over his cage brood. When her boyfriend, his finger tapping the inform informational placard, pointed out the presidential silverback's name, coincidentally, was Baraka. The woman laughed aloud until she saw me the other 400 pound gorilla in the room stuffing something that might have been the last of a, a beef stick popsicle or a tikita banana in my mouth. Then she became disconsolate, crying and apologizing for having spoken her mind and for my having been born. Some of my best friends are monkeys, she said accidentally. It was my turn to laugh. I understood where she was coming from. This whole city, is, this whole city is a Freudian slip of the tongue, a concrete hard on for America's deeds and misdeeds, slavery, manifest destiny. Loven and Sally standing by idly while Germany tried to kill every Jew in Europe, while some of my best friends are the Museum of African Art, the Holocaust Museum, the Museum of the American India, Indian, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, and furthermore, I will have you know my sister's daughter is married to an orangutan. All it takes is a day trip through Georgetown and Chinatown, and a shouter past the White House, Phoenix House, Blair House, and the local crack house for the message to become abundantly clear. Be it ancient Rome or modern day America, you are either a citizen or a slave, a lion or a Jew, guilty or innocent comfortable or uncomfortable. And here in the Supreme Court of the United States of America, fuck it if between the handcuffs and the slipperiness of these chairs leather upholstery, the only way I can keep from spilling my ass ignominiously onto the goddamn floor is to lean back until I am reclined at an angle just sort of detention room, nonchalance, but definitely well past the courtroom. Walk keys jangling like sleigh bells, the court officers march into the chambers like a two by two wagonless team of citadels, harnessed together by a love of God and country. The lead day, a proud bywiser of a woman with a brightly colored sash of citations, rainbow across her chest, taps the back of my seat. She wants, me, she, she wants me to sit up straight, but the legendary civil disobedient that I am, I defiantly tilt myself even further back in the chair, only to crash to the floor in a painful pratfall of inept, nonviolent resistance. She dangles a handcuff key in my face and with one thick hairless arm, hoaxes me upright, scooting my chair in so close to the table that I can see my suit and ties reflection. It is signing. I've never worn a suit before, and the man who sold me this promised me that it's, it's going to look good. That's it, and the reason why I actually have decided to choose this book is because The Sellout is a 2015 novel by Paul Betty that was published uh, by Fora and Struess, and in the United Kingdom by One World Publications in 2016. The novel takes place in and around Los Angeles, California, and Moses about the state of racial relations in the U.S. today. In October of 2016, it won the Booker Prize, making Betty the first U.S. writer to win that award. And published in 2015, the sellout was the latest in Betty's body of work that explores racial identity in the United States and the perversive historical effects of racism. The novel was released during a time of racial reckoning surrounding multiple instances of police brutality and the Ferguson, Missouri protests. 
The narrator and most of the characters are African-Americans in an urban farming area in the fictional town of Dickens, California. The story begins with the narrator standing trial before the Supreme Court for crimes related to his attempt to restore slavery and segregation in his hometown of Dickens, an agrarian ghetto on the outskirts of Los Angeles, California, sitting before the court starts to reflect on what led up to this moment and recounts his upbringing. He had a tenuous relationship with his father, an unorthodox sociologist who performed numerous traumatizing social experiments on him as a child and held lofty expectations to become a respected community leader in Dickens. A few years before the Supreme Court case, his father is murdered by the police after which he struggles to find his identity and a purpose in life. At first, he is content to withdraw from the community and continue his agricultural endeavors of growing artisanal watermelons and marijuana, which are his father's judgment. The sellout has been seen by many as a critique of the idea that African American society is post-racial, according to the literary scholar Henry Ivey, the satirical devices used throughout the book bring attention to the current issues of systemic racism and, the mock, and, the, and mock the conventional approaches that American society has taken to remedy these issues. One of the reasons why I actually decided to choose the book is because uh, not just it matches with changing times in terms of racism in modern day America, but also it addresses issues of race and humanity because uh, a person without a voice is not a human being. A human being is a thinking being and is endowed with dignity and self-worth. And as a result, we are all persons in different colors. So the book not only serves as an advocacy tool against racism in the United States of America, but it also goes beyond that in the literary world to show us how interconnected we are as human beings. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, um, Modlamen, and that brings an end to um, the reading part. Thank you so much, Erno. Thank you so much, um, Lala and Modlamen. And it's um, over to um, Mr. Jawor and Mr. Seka to deliberate while we have the Cora player play. Um, Mr. Uh, Jali Bach Conte is our entertainer um, this afternoon, and he'll be playing Cora, uh, playing traditional um, Gambian music and historical music for that matter. So, Lala him to play. He's also part of the program while Mr. Seka and Mr. Jao um, uh, decide and we'll get back to them shortly. Yeah. 
Mr. Jao, if you're ready, it's all yeah. over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and um, we've taken time to listen to the uh, various readers, and uh, we've reached a conclusion as to our choice of uh, a book here. Um, well, let's just look at first. Um, Chernogay Gay read about James Baldwin. Uh, depicting the situation prevailing at that time in the U.S. And uh, there was this struggle for identity. And, uh, you know, he tried to make the connection between the African colonial experience and the, you know, the uh, people in the U.S. at the time, black people in the U.S. at the time. And then on for, for Lala, on the why should all be feminists. And, um, again, here it shows the discrimination that has prevailed, you know, as regards uh, women, both in the United States and in Africa. And, um, and um, well, it also uh, explained the different expectations from, you know, women as well as men. And the very fact that um, uh, at a very young age, the, you know, there is a separation between boys and girls, you know, what they are taught to and, and them. You know, so the objective here, according to what Lala read, is for, for uh, the young people, you know, both boys and girls to be taught to respect each other at a very early age, you know, probably when they grow up, the situation will change. But unfortunately, uh, it still remains uh, not very encouraging, but eventually I'm sure we'll get there. Then the, the, the third one, sell out by Betty. Um, Mr. So, again, depicted, you know, it's a depiction of uh, the life of the black person in the United States. And uh, the very fact that systemic racism, even though a lot of progress has been made um, since then, but it's still evident there because uh, the book was uh, published in 2015. It shows you that, you know, there is still systemic racism in the U.S. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, those are the, uh, the issues that, uh, as far as uh, I can summarize, what was from the reading. And, uh, you know, we have looked at it uh, with my colleague, uh, Mr. Seka, who happens to be a very I mean, prolific writer. He's got so many books published, so he's definitely somebody who's read all these books. And, you know, he's in a very a better position, actually, to... Uh, pick out among the three books which uh, uh, we think he thinks we definitely the one that has um, won the day here. So um, on that note, I'll just hand over to Mr. Seka, then he will just um, tell us exactly uh, the book we have chosen and uh, why we have chosen that bo book. Yeah, thank you very much. Of course, um, Samuel Usman says, under the property of Africa, yo, truth is the monopoly of the elders. Mr. Jao is my uncle, <laughs> so <laughs> I should give him the due respect to choose. But when it comes to the academia, a student wants to voice out his I mean, choice. Okay, Mr. Gay, you started the quotation, but the quotation doesn't end there. Baldwin, or called Jimmy, goes further to see we can live with our indifference and love each other as far as the indifference doesn't question my humanity. You know, he was born in 1924 and died in 1987 in the, late, in the, in the last days of November. But his adopted country was uh, in, in France. So he wrote so many books about Ameri uh, the civic rights and about the Negro. 
One of his essays, which was very important, was the essay called The Fifth Avenue, Uptown, where he came out with a sentence with seven words that Moses also said to Pharaoh, let my people go. He also said the Negro should want to be treated like a man. So you have all done very well. You have all conducted research. Here is not a matter of saying this is the best or what. But Cherno, uh, James Baldwin, is the best as far as two of us can see. In the sense that he has manifested the, prof the prophecy made by Dibua that there will become a day when the Negro will revolt. And that was manifested in the slave revolts way back in Africa. But I shall be very unfair if I just fail to read you the conclusive paragraph by Chino Achebe, who wrote a postscript on this great man. He said, as long as injustice exists, whether it be within the American nation itself or between it and its neighbors, as long as a tiny cartel of rich creditor nations can hold the rest in iron chains of usury, so long as one third or less of mankind eats well and often to excess, while two thirds and more live perpetually with hunger, as long as white people who constitute a mere fraction of the human race consider it natural and even righteous to dominate the rainbow majority when, whenever and wherever they are thrown together. And the oldest of them all, the discrimination of, by men against women, as long as it passes, the words of J James Baldwin will be there to bear witness and to inspire and elevate the struggle for human freedom. So based on that, premise on that, Mr. Gay, I mean, this man is very important in the liberation of Negroes as well as civic rights. But thank you, all of you, for a job well done. You've all done very well. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Seka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jao. And thank you again, Lala. Thank you very much, um, Mudlamen. Um, congratulations, Cherno. It's not a competition. Um, it's um, the readathon, but we decided to, um, uh, especially the Center for Studies in Africa and its diaspora, decided to um, take this angle this year. But thank you so much for coming and then um, sharing these compelling books, um, reading from them um, this afternoon. It means a lot to all of us. And um, you're all going home as winners. So we've decided to uh, print some certificates, and the ambassador will hand over those certificates to you. But again, thank you so much. And while the ambassador is doing that, we'll have Jelly um, play the chora to um, thank you and to entertain us as well. <laughs> much and um, that will bring an end to this program unless we want to give the ambassador to say thank you. Thank you. I am so inspired um, to read all three authors. Um, again, this one, this author, Paul Beatty, is a new one to me, but the other two I'm very familiar with. Um, I really want to thank you all for coming out to read the passages and to help us understand why you chose them, why they're important, and they are, each of them, very important. And I'm very impressed with our judges who defended their decision um, very well, and, and I thank you for taking your time to come out today. 
I'm really inspired. I want to do this more often. We should do it more than ju just once a year. It's, it was fun to listen to you all. And again, I admire what you do and admire everything that you bring to, to important discussions and, uh, and what you represent in terms of the Gambia best and brightest. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jelly. <laughs>